Hey guys, so I wanted to make a commentary on Rudy's video of whether or not VIP Masters Edition is too cheap at $100. And the answer is yes, based on what will probably be in the set, which uh, even though I don't really know yet, I can only guess and I guarantee it. So they can sell it, just like the Collector's Editions, they must add a ton of value from it. And the VIP edition is the, you know, the chase of the chase, right? I mean, it's $100 a pack. We don't really have magic packs worth that much money. And it's a big gamble. It's a very big gamble. $100 is a lot of money right now during COVID-19. Or even not during COVID-19, during any time. And the reason this is not going to work well for Wizards of the Coast is based on my own experience. So let me explain something to you. Um, when you whale on something, part of whaling in any community is you flex on the non-whales, maybe the dolphins or the regular tuna. And that's the, you know, that's why people spend so much money on mobile games, not only because they enjoy it, but they do enjoy showing off, right? They love showing off their accounts. Uh, I'm guilty of this as well, of course. But now the Typical whale isn't exactly who you think. It's uh, typically someone who owns a lot of income. You, so you have to make a lot of money. For you to spend, I think there was a guy in Japan who spent seventy to $80,000 on fake grand order. For you to spend that type of money, you have to have that type of money. But it's someone who doesn't really have a life outside of the mobile game or the Magic the Gathering. And Magic the Gathering is their life. So any disposable income they have will go back into the game which you probably know people like that. So it's not always about how much money you make. It's a combination of how much money you make, how much um, disposable income you have, and how, what percentage of that disposable income you will spend on Magic the Gathering. Those are the type of people, high disposable income, high wages, and high ability to spend into Magic. There, there is no body who does not want a vip pack if i showed told you hey i'm going to sell you a vip pack for four dollars you would buy it no doubt you would buy it because you knew it was you knew the value of the pack is more than four dollars obviously so let's talk about the nuts and bolts of why this is bad in in my own case uh, so when i first moved to houston in 2012 uh, my playgroup was very diverse. I met my playgroup at DNA Comics. Now we did to go to Swords and Superheroes when that, and Battle Bunker and so on. And the playgroup had people from all paths of life. There were people who were still in school. There were people who were in high school. There were people who were in college. There were people who didn't have jobs. There were people who probably were in, were likely on disability. Um, there were people who just enjoy playing Magic. And at the same time, you have business owners. Uh, one of the people I played with, he owned a restaurant business. I, at the time, worked at a startup. So you did have people with money that could buy things to help the store. That diversity no longer exists anymore. And I don't know what happened, but my play group right now, they're extremely wealthy. And I'm not entirely sure like how that became, how I went from one play group that was really casual and had all people from all walks of life to my current play group where we draft Innistrad or we're drafting original Zendikar every month before the COVID, you know, COVID changes some things, of course. Um, I don't know what happened. Like something had happened in between the time in 2012 until today where I don't, I mean, everyone I play, everyone I know who texts me and plays Magic is wealthy. And I, what, it was never my intention to do that. And now you might be like, oh, well, are they all white cis male? No, they're diverse. There's African Americans. I'm Asian. There's uh, obviously white people. Um, there's even a uh, half Native American who owns a casino up in Oklahoma um, that I play with. And we... Um, we, we play Fake Grand Order as well. So it's kind of like we all of our other hobbies mesh with each other. We like sports cards. And as I mentioned before, we like Panini Eminence. So we'll like split a box. And, you know, that box is like 
five thousand dollars or something like that so we'll split the cards in the box and we'll see what everyone gets and it's kind of exciting when we open it at some point in time there's going to be two groups of people there's going to be the people who can afford a hundred dollar packs or at that time maybe a thousand dollar packs and there's people who cannot there's people who buy the collector's edition of the booster pack box and there's people who do not but the, peop the collector's edition absolutely has a price effect on the non-collector's edition. You can look at Ikoria, you can look at any standard set where there's a collector's edition and compare it, you know, the booster, the standard booster box expected value. It's much, much lower if the set does not. So sets that do not have collector's editions, minus the masterpieces for obvious reasons, um, their expected value is much higher because to get a uh, Liliana, let's say to get a, um, well, Liliana has been reprinted, but let's say to get a Liliana the Veil and Innistrad, there wasn't a special edition of her which would diminish the foil copy or diminish the regular copy. That was the, a card. If you had to foil Liliana from the regular set, that would be worth a lot. The multiplier of foils, for instance, was most affected because everything in a collector's edition is foil, therefore the foil supply of the regular card has drastically increased. But the percentage of you getting a foil card in a regular standard box has remained the same. It just has increased drastically on the other end of the collector's editions. So when you do talk about impact and what does this impact and you know, it's, I don't know if this is the direction in which the coach wants to go into. It's splitting its play group into two different parties. And it's not based on gender. It's not based on race. It's not based on sex. It's not based on gender identification or political. It's based simply on how much money you have. And that itself, you know, should be a policy that Wizard Coast looks at very hard. They obviously care about Black Lives Matter so much, and they obviously care about gender identification. But they don't care about classism. And I think that's very dangerous for Wizard of the Coast long term. Because there's many mobile games that do separate. Eventually, the people who are not spending as much money, they're going to be like, oh, I can't afford $100 a pack. I'm not even going to get started in that game. That's one of the hugest barriers to entry. When people hear that it's a hundred dollar magic pack, a new player is not going to understand. That's the most valuable. That's they're not going to. They're just going to get the the news article, right? The highlight. Oh, a hundred dollars for a magic pack. That's expensive. No, I don't want that. Oh, it's probably better for me. And your know, magic is a very expensive hobby. Would you recommend like a new player start? No, I would not. It would be too expensive. So you'd have no new players coming in. For paper magic, at least, and the new pl and the players that you do have, you're going from you know I was regular masters, original modern masters. One was six ninety nine a pack. You went from three ninety nine pack to six ninety nine pack to nine ninety nine pack, all the way up to a hundred dollars a pack. Like you know, it's only going one way, right? It's not getting cheaper to get these things. And I think it's going to be a major flaw in the future because your play group should be diverse. It should have people from all economic. So my play group, we are very diverse in terms of races, in terms of sex. We have two female magic players. I never speak of it because obviously, you know, there's a narrative that I want to go up for, <laughs> obviously, but we do. And um, one's a very successful nurse and the other one is a very successful biologist and they both enjoy magic and they both have tier one decks in legacy we all have tier one decks in legacy so just to summarize again i think it comes down to the issue of classism and that's a big issue that's as big of an issue in my opinion you know when you don't make you only make this amount of money i live in one of the poorest places in the u.s you can go on it, uh, Humble, Texas. I mean, I've already gone over this a million times and people still will say, oh, this is a great place to live. Yeah, it's so great that our per capita is uh, either 17000 or $20,000. I 
a person. So great that one in more than one in five people are in poverty, right? It's so great that eight more than eighty percent of the people who live here don't have have never gone to college, not even for one semester. It's so great that we are three hundred times three hundred percent more likely, three times as likely to be a victim of crime than anywhere else in Texas, or I mean, than the average place in Texas. I know what classism look like, looks like. It's not good. It's not good. And that is what's happening in Magic the Gathering right now. And eventually it will destroy the game. It's very sad. I don't know how the game came to this point where they're selling $100 packs. And the majority of people cannot afford those $100 packs. And the ones that will buy the $100 packs like Alpha Investments and others will flex. That's the whole point of a $100 pack, isn't it? Bye, guys.